Ladies and gentlemen, angry Americans around the country and around the world, welcome to another powerful, inspiring, important conversation with a man that I just love talking to. I've been honored to get to know over the last couple of years. I am constantly inspired by, I think he brings some of the best energy in America, even though he's a Navy guy. Uh, the great and powerful Montel Williams is joining us on <laughs> Angry Americans. How are you, sir? Thanks so much for having me today, Paul. Really, really good to be here with you, my friend. Uh, I was trying to think back to when we met. I think we met, got to be over a decade ago in yes. the veteran space, right? Do you remember where Eas exactly? Easily over a decade ago. And I'm telling you, I don't remember because I know I spoke at one of your first events. Yep. But we had met before that. Could it have been at a Fisher House? It could have been. Yeah, it might it have been. been a, it could have been at a Fisher House event, you know, because I know you're very good friends with Ken Fisher and so am I. And we're, you know, I'm, I'm a board member of Fisher House and, uh, you know, I've been working with them diligently for years. And I think we met at a Fisher House event fundraiser, maybe. And then we carried on ever since. That might be it. That might be. It. I think it's one of the things I want to get into with you, Montel, because I think sure. folks in the military community know about your military background, but maybe the civilian world and broader world may not. One of the many fascinating, interesting parts of who you are. You got, you were talking about it before we started. You got to tell people about the shirt you're wearing. Because oh, you well, you got to know. It yeah. says the words fear right there, but that fear represents fear to go, baby. No, the Naval Academy, United States Naval Academy, class of 1980. I, you know, I'm dating myself right now, but you know, for a lot of people out there that don't know, I entered the military. I'm a, I am a true, no kidding Vietnam vet. I came in in 1970. Four, really never said 73 I signed on in a delayed entry program after graduating from high school I entered the Marine Corps as an enlisted man went through back then the pre congressional investigation uh, uh, boot camp at Paris Island um, in 1974 I uh, got meritorious promoted out of boot camp to uh, PSC uh, my original MOS was uh, 2800 I was a communications electronics guy but because of my meritorious promotion, when I got sent out to school, which was at that time, 29 stumps out in the middle of the desert, I um, got shifted over out of the school program and put into a troop handler position because they were short. And I got meritorious promoted again to Lance Corporal. And then I got picked to, uh, selected to go to the Naval Academy Prep School. Um, and I entered the Naval Academy Prep School. I put on E4. The day before, I, I did a lateral transfer out of the Marine Corps into the Navy to go to the Naval Academy. I went through the Naval Academy, uh, and my degree was in general engineering, got a minor in international security affairs. My language at the Academy was Chinese. Um, and it's, it's only important because right before graduation, unbeknownst to me or the U.S. military, I suffered my first bout of MS, but nobody knew that. Nobody yeah. back then in 1970, 19, you know, 79, 1980, MS was a disease that was characterized as a disease of Northern European women or Northern people of Northern European, Northern European, Europe, European women, and was really diagnosed primarily about 100% in women. Yeah, and, I was really hoping you could share this because I, I think it's yeah. an inspiring part of your story. You you found out or you started to experience symptoms of MS when you were in the Naval Academy, right? I was at the Naval Academy. Yeah. I tell you what happened It's really really bizarre. We got you know uh, back back then you can check the records. I could check the records. Um, you know, the class of 1980 in the military or at the Naval Academy was the last class to receive our pre commissioning immunizations by the gun. Oh, because boy. what happened was the first hundred guys that went through that line, we got an overdose of diphtheria typhoid in the gun. It immediately sent me into the hospital. I went, I, I, I went into some symptoms that nobody could explain. I was seen at Walter Reed, Bethesda, Johns Hopkins. Um, I went to just, just an immediate crazy MS bout. Now let's say this very importantly, yeah. the shot didn't cause MS. I probably had the gene because I am, you know, my mother is biracial. Her mother was from Northern European descent. Um, I'm the first person in my family lineage to have a neurological disorder. But the extreme shock to my system from that shot overdose, you know, probably elicited the immune response that I had that actually triggered MS, but nobody could figure out what it was. Wow. I literally, this is 12 weeks before graduation, man. You know, after I busted my ass for four years trying to get out of that place to get on home in my life. And as a matter of fact, when I graduated, um, I was supposed to go into Marine Corps air. 
but unfortunately my bout left me half blind in my left eye. So the military put me on a hold. I'm really the first person in the history of the Naval Academy to walk across the stage to receive, receive their diploma, got to throw my hat in the air, but I wasn't commissioned that day. Normally what happens, if you could put on a medical hold, they don't give you your diploma until you right. actually graduate. Right. Or actually leave. I got my diploma. I was commissioned. So now all of a sudden the Navy's got me in this really weird, weird, uh, you know, category. I literally graduated, uh, I think it was May 10th, Maybe May 15th, I was put on medical hold. I was commissioned into the rank of midshipman. Now, just so you understand, midshipman is a wartime rank. Mm -hmm. So I'm one of the only people to actually carry that rank and get paid that rank, half an ensign's pay for the next six months until they finally figured out that, you know, things weren't going to straighten out. So I got commissioned in MPQ, you know that that is, it's not physically qualified. And because I would lost vision in my left eye, the Marine Corps wouldn't take me back because you have to have correctable vision to 2020 to serve in the Marine Corps, even with classes. So mm -hmm. since I didn't, they offered me two jobs. One was supply corps and the other was special duty intelligence officer, cryptological officer, because I had Chinese language background. So I said, Psh, I'm not gonna be a supply corps officer. Psh, I went to China, went and, and took the MPQ as a, uh, special duty cryptological officer. But what's crazy about that, my friend, is I was supposed to be not physically qualified for a line position. I ended up getting 600 days at sea, 300 of those, uh, approximately 300 of those days under the water and the rest of those on the water as a direct support cryptologist. Because once I graduated, once I, I got commissioned and I picked that, I ended up going out to DLI as the Defense Logistics Agency or Linguistics Agency as a Russian linguist. So I took Russian at the DLI and then went into direct support. So I, you know, I fought the Russian bear for, you know, my next nine years of active duty, which was really kind of crazy, especially now that we have a, you know, a Russian kiss ass, um, you know, it, it really spits in the face of all of us that, that work so hard and put our lives on the line doing missions to collect data and to, to, to thwart what's happening today. I'm glad you I'm glad you laid that foundation because it's really, I think, going to shape our conversation in a lot of different ways. Um, oh, and, and, and you're you're the master of communications and your ability to summarize that I think so quickly <laughs> and succinctly is part of the reason why America's loved you for, for so long. But let me ask you, Montel, a question I've been asking everybody. Um, you know, you've been very public about your your, your MS and, and your entire journey. But let's take a step back. Where are you now and how are you? How have you been dealing with this pandemic? You know, where in the, in the country are you and, and how are you doing? Well, I'm actually coming to you physically from Miami, Florida. So I'm coming right now from the epicenter of the pandemic. Yeah. And it's an epicenter because we got a dumbass who is the governor of the state who's kissing another dumbass's ass that's, you know, allowed this thing to perpetuate the way it has here in Florida, refusing to close bars and things until, you know, recently and really being about as ignorant as he possibly can as people die and more and more people die. So I'm a little angry about that, but because I mean, right here, dude, I, I gotta I stay inside. Mm -hmm. I literally, you know, my wife is right now down at our pool in our building, which the pool deck area is open because she's down and getting some sun, but I don't walk out of this room, out of, out of this apartment without putting, you know, a mask on, gloves on, you know, glasses on to keep myself from possibly putting myself in harm's way because I do have a compromised immune system. You know, I take medication that compromises my immune system almost every day. So, you know, I got to really be very, very careful. Um, where am I with MS? I will tell you, uh, Paul, is very, very interesting. I've been working on an initiative now for the last really uh, almost nine and a half years. It's an initiative, it's a, it's a, it's a, a medical device, it's called a PONS device, a portable neuromodulation device, which recently received from the FDA a category of a breakthrough medical device uh, 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 standing. And they got that because of this device's ability to help with, number one, the device is already approved right now in Canada, FDA approved in Canada, has been treating patients in Canada for now the last three years with PTSD, with, sorry, with traumatic brain injury, mild to moderate for balance and gait. 
very recently received this FDA approval for, or FDA, sorry, category as a breakthrough medical device for MS. I've been using this device now for the last 10 years, and it literally is the reason why I think I've done as well with MS now for the last 10 years. Um, it's a device that literally sends a signal, I'll tell it to you very quickly, it's called a PONS device, Portable Neuromodulation Device. It sends a signal through the tongue, which is the tongue is one of the only organs in our body that has two cranial nerves. Those two cranial nerves connect in the back of the brain, in the pons area of the brain, send a signal back through the brain that helps to put the brain, and we've now been proven through you know, peer-reviewed studies to put the brain in a plastic state to help the brain find pathways around damage. So I've literally been working on a device where we're working really hard, trying our best, and very recently, within, you know, I think very, very short order, um, we should get full FDA approval. We should have gotten FDA approval three years ago, but you know how our FDA is. It's really mm -hmm. kind of crazy. But so we have a device that was made here in the United States of America, created at the University of Wisconsin. I helped put, move this, this device forward. We ended up getting clearance for the device in Canada. We're about to, and we've been working on getting clearance for it in Australia, in the EU. We can treat soldiers all over the world, but we can't treat soldiers right here in the United States for something that we could actually be, be benefiting them with immediately. But, you know, that's how we are. And, uh, you know, I've been using this device myself and uh, continue to use it. And um, it's really kept me on, the, on a really good pass. It's, it, it has... I believe, and this is me talking because now we are proving this with the FDA, but it has literally slowed down the progression of my disease and kept me in, uh, you know, a rare fighting form. Uh, I, that, that, that whole thing with the tongue blows my mind. <laughs> I gotta tell you, yeah, it's, it's, hearing it's, it's, that for the first time and I'm sure folks are like, wait a minute, what? Like, so, you know, I, I again, I, I love talking to you because you can pack out. So I want to talk about DeSantis. I want to talk about politics. I want to talk about how you've really been an advocate for uh, a lot of survivors, right? On, 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 on MS, you've been an advocate for veterans. You've been an advocate for medical cannabis. Um, but I don't even know if you are able to consume adult beverages, as we'd say in the military. But another question we ask of all our guests on Angry Americans, Monta, what is your drink or, or cocktail of choice? Well, you know, I'm going to tell you something, my friend. It, and this is, I am not a teetotaler. I am just a realist. Yeah. I take a particular medication that if you read what it says on the warning label is that alcohol consumption can exacerbate adverse reactions at the injection site location. Mm. So since my diagnosis with MS and since my, uh, one, one, I think two days after I started taking this particular medication, I stopped drinking. Now, when I say I stopped drinking, I have had in the last five years, I've had maybe a sip of champagne uh, on New Year's Eve um, champagne would be, if I was going to be a drinker again, would be my drink of choice. But let me back up. Now, when I was in the Navy and I was actually on board submarines, my drink of choice was the brown liquor, my man. I was a mm -hmm. scotch drinker and was, you know, you know, a single malt scotch drinker. And if I were going to go back to drinking tomorrow, it would be a fifth of scotch sitting on that table in there. But I, I woke up one day after a submarine mission, you know, we, back in the day, you know, we used to, uh, I won't go to, I, I, you know, I don't know why, man. I still feel like I am, though I'm not constrained by security uh, regulations. I don't, I don't believe in talking about, you know, what I did on active duty. Because uh, I used to say used to, security constraints preclude me from discussing anything I did while on active duty. However, you know, I used to do, you know, some pretty serious submarine missions that used to culminate in pulling into back then Holy Lock, Scotland, and of course the home of Scotch. Wow. So, you know, after, you know, 90 days at sea without anything to drink, you know, I, uh, you, you would pull into Holy Lock and, you know, you and five or six other people would go out and each person would sit down at the table with a Scotch, uh, with a, with a fifth of Scotch and didn't leave the table until that fifth was gone. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I was, uh, I was a pretty heavy drinker back then for a while. And then I stopped, but you know, so scotch so, uh, and champagne. Scotch and, and, and champagne. Now, you will, you, well, well, scotch will fit well into the show. You'll be happy to see where we end the conversation. And I mm -hmm. think the only other person in the entire entirety of this show who said champagne was Rosie Perez. 
So you oh, and Rosie you Perez, maybe when, when, when the pandemic is over, we can get all our guests back together. And you and Rosie can can share a glass of champagne. Have you ever met Rosie before? I've met Rosie before. We like maybe at a boxing a match or something. I think Rosie did. Man. Rosie did my show years ago. Did she? Yes, way way back. I think you know maybe after a. Oh, it was it was it was it do the right thing. I can't remember which movie she was in with Spike Lee. Uh, but yeah, she did my show way way back. So I, I want to talk to you about so many things, but I, I want to maybe ask you Montel to talk about. Um, this moment in America, right? You've been at a really amazing intersection point throughout your life in, in the national security space, in the media space. You've worked on Capitol Hill. You've traveled around the world. Can you break down, uh, given that background and given your, your wealth of experience, this moment in America, your thoughts on Trump, where we are right now, and maybe the next couple of months ahead, what you see and, and what you want to see. I just want to give you a chance to just go with the ball and, and run wherever you want. But I think you know, what, what, what's your take on where we are at this really critical, important moment in time, Montel? I'm really fearful of the fact that we're sitting on the precipice of the, the, of, of the downfall of America. I mean, I, I, I never thought in my entire life I would ever say that. But when we look at how extreme we are as a society and we've pushed ourselves into individual corners and can't wait for the bell to ring so we can go out and punch someone from the, uh, from the other corner in the face. And that person from the other corner is an American. Mm. I fear that we are, are on the verge of literally kissing what was best about America goodbye, unless we wake up. And I see some hope in the fact that the youth of America and this next generation of America seems to want to overcome this and continue to move forward. But I think we've literally put ourselves in a place where we backed America into a corner that's going to take us 10 to 15 years to get out of. Unfortunately, you know, I'm hitting one of those ages where, you know, I don't know if I've got a good 15 years left. I mean, I probably should. I hope I do. You know, if I were to, you know, uh, listen to the stats that were put out by prognosticators who believe that African-American men who have, you know, MS have a 15% less or 15% shorter life expectancy than we would normally have, then I should have been gone already. And I'm not gone. But I hope I'm here to see America literally live up to its birthright of being the true land of the free and home of the brave. But right now, we seem to be the land of the enslaved by mind and the home of the coward. And, you know, I never thought I would say that in my life. You know, I, I, like you and so many others have, you know, put our hands in the hair and we have said it with all the vehemence of our heart that we do solemnly swear and affirm to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. But we're living in a time right now where those who claim to have taken that oath, whether it be Congress or the Senate or some of our other elected officials, really spit right on their hand when they take it because they know they don't believe it. Mm. And they are people who do solemnly swear and affirm to support and defend anything that can make their bank accounts higher and make their lives better and make sure that they can have a legal right to hate and really be as vile against our fellow man as they can be. And that's really what bothers me right now. And I'm praying and hoping that people who watch your podcast and who really believe in the theory that we had way, way back of trying to build a perfect union, I hope those people understand that this perfect union could be so fleeting that by the time you wake up, you'll be trying to figure out how quickly you can get to a DLI and take a Russian class mm. or take a Chinese class. Mm. Mm. To, uh, building on that point, Montel, um, you understand the national security dynamics You've been on submarines. You've studied, you know, the foreign languages that are right now at the forefront. Um, we've been talking on my show a lot about the bounty gate story. You know, the the the, the story oh. about Russians paying bounties to kill Americans and Trumps. Now it's been weeks, still hasn't responded. 
Um, can you his break refusal down- two days ago. He yeah. refused two days ago to even bring it up and lied and said, we don't talk about discussions that I have with foreign leaders when that's a bunch of crap because we know that every time he talks to a foreign leader before this, he would put out you know, some sort of a memo at least trying to talk about what he said. He's kicked the translators out of the room. He's kicked some of the other people who are consultants out of the room so he can do the conversations by himself. How dare you say out of one side of your mouth that I truly am the best thing in, since sliced bread when it comes to our soldiers? And then out of the other side of your mouth, say, I don't give a damn if people put bounties on their head or people give the, our enemy weapons to hurt us. I don't care about that. Come on, man. You know, and the fact that there are people out there who, I'm sorry, Paul, who wear uniforms that still support this butthead. And remember, let's go back and remember, this is a punk ass who took pride in himself of being able to lie and get a deferment about Bone spurs, give me a break. Mm-hmm. Refused to put a uniform on, but now enjoys playing with the little army men that he was probably playing on, playing with them on his bedroom floor when he was a kid, knocking them over and plucking them and throwing them and burning them. You know what I mean? Come on. Yeah, I think, and I think- you, you're going to act like this guy really believes in the uniform, really believes in that oath that he took with his hand on a Bible that he probably never read before he put his hand on. Stop. Mm-hmm. What, how do you break down, Montel? I'm with you on that, of course. How do, how do you break down, um, you know, I, I've talked a lot about the politicization of the military, and now he's, you know, deploying DHS troops into places like Portland. Um, can, can you go a bit deeper into what you think about how our military and our civilians are being pitted against each other, right? Like, he, he's turning up the volume. You're a guy who, in, in, you know, in, in many ways, you were at a really important intersection of, of understanding race in this country. You touched on issues on your show that a lot of people didn't talk about. For a long time, you were one of the only African-American hosts on television. You know, you were breaking ground, but also forcing conversations, some of which were uncomfortable. You know, what, 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 what do you see right now? And, and how do you yeah. break this down to include the Black Lives Matter movement? What, what are your thoughts on, on where we are on all that, Monta? You know, I think, you know, I'm an enigma in a sense because you know, my entire life, I've, you know, if, if we, I, I hate labels. I hate this idea of Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal. I'm not yeah. any of that. I'm an independent. I look at the issue in front of my face. I do the research and I make a decision based on what I find. Okay. It's really disturbing to me that I think the last time that we saw troops in neighborhoods on U.S. soil wearing uniforms that didn't have their names on them, really taking aim at brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, and cousins was during a civil war. Hmm. I mean, think of a time when Americans put troops on the ground in the United States of America to fight against their brother. We've had cases that go before the Supreme Court about soldiers who have followed unlawful orders and people who are people who are federal employees who follow unlawful orders. I, I can't for the life of me, I, I tell you something, it disturbs me. I, I try to turn, change the channel on the television when I see federal troops like, you know, what about a week ago, that Naval Academy grad who, was walking up to the line and he said, all he asked was, do you, why don't you support the oath you took? You know, I do solemnly swear and affirm to support and defend the constitution. And they beat him. Yep. Man, it brought tears in my eyes. I, I was taken so far back. I didn't know really how to even respond to myself. You know, it was like I had three brain cells in my head that were, were fighting each other, you know, yeah. going back and forth and beating each other up, going, well, he shouldn't have been out there, but then he should have been out there. Yes, he should have been there. There's no reason why he shouldn't have been there. You know, the first tenet of our Constitution is the First Amendment. The First Amendment says get freedom of speech. And well, we're going to send people out there to beat people into silence? We got a president who seems to admire seems to, you know, lord over the idea of being an oligarch himself, of being 
you know, a tyrant who believes that he has the right to send people out to beat American citizens. And he does so without showing any empathy whatsoever. He does so without out even showing any concern for protecting the Constitution. He's trying to just protect his own ideas. You read his own words. This is a guy that during his upbringing prided himself on being able to go and try to strong arm minorities who were laid on rent. This is a guy who prided himself on being able to say as racist the things that he wanted to say. And let's, you know, I'm not talking about just the N word. I'm talking about just to be as racist as he could be. Right. He prided himself in this. Yet, Paul, no matter what we do, what we say, 80% of the Republicans in this country still back him. Why? Because if you take a look at the bank accounts of all those Republicans since they, this clown's been in office, their bank accounts have gone up. Yeah. This has been the fleecing of America. That's what nobody's really even talking about. The fact that, you know, what was it? I think it was Lyndon Johnson said, you know, the best thing you could do is tell the poorest white man that he is better than the best black man and he'll let you put his hand, put your hand in his pocket and empty it out. Something like that. That's mm -hmm, paraphrasing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But Donald Trump seems to believe that. Yeah. Make sure you can find an enemy that those who now have permission to hate will hate along with you. See, I think that's what this guy has done. He's given license to hate. He's given license to being able to say you're disgusted with your fellow human, your fellow American. And let, let's just get this crap straight. You know, if in fact we ended up under communist rule or under Russian rule, <laughs> you think that you have it bad right now? God, God, cut me a break. But people are too blind to see because they're so blinded by Finally, hoo -hoo, I get to hate people. I get to, I get to say what I want to say. I get to call people names. I get to do this with impunity. Yay. Really? Mm. Well, mm -hmm. let's remember it took all of us to get here. Mm. Whether we got here because all of us, some of us were chained and beaten to help get us here. It didn't matter. It took all of us to get us here. Hmm. it's going to take all of us to get us out of here. It's just like taking a look right now what's going on across the country with this coronavirus. Come on, man. How simple do we have to make this? Take a look at the countries that have won this battle. We are acting like one of the worst third world countries on the planet. Yeah, it's a lack of discipline. That's one thing that I've been oh. trying to highlight. I think that we need to underscore is, you know, every generation of Americans had a level of discipline. And that's really what it comes down to. I mean, there, there's a video that, that I'll play on the show of the Marine saying, look, you got to wear shoes when you go in the supermarket. You got to wear a shirt, wear a fucking mask. Is it too much to ask? Like, be disciplined. And I think helping people understand the long-term impact is, is one thing. But even in the immediate impact, I said last week, wear a mask. Don't kill Norman Lear, right, who's 98 right. years old, not, now 98. Don't kill Montel Williams, right? Like, right. don't get you sick, these people who are valuable to our society. But I think there's a core element here I've talked about before, Montel, that that support Trump, that continue to support Trump, that really fall into two groups. A group that really doesn't know, right, or doesn't want to know, or thinks it's, it's to their personal benefit, right? Says, you know what, it, this, it, guy, it, this guy will benefit me, or they've been convinced to that point. But you touched on something I really wanted to get into, Montel. This is, uh, I'm an independent. This is a show for anybody, but especially for politically independent, unaffiliated people. You have been one of the few voices in the media um, you know, out there publicly that's consistently been a political independent, used to be a Republican, right? I think, in, and, and left the Republican Party decades yes. ago. But we're, we're, we're lacking uh, independent voices. But I feel like we are a, a fan base without a team, right? We're like Seattle sports fans without the Supersonics. Like, we're here. Yes. We're waiting for our team. We're waiting for our coach, right? How do you see the, the landscape of independent politics? And, and, uh, and, 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 you know, you're a guy, would you ever run? Are there any other independent leaders that you've been impressed by or you're looking to? I don't, I don't you know, I, unfortunately, Paul, and I, I, and I don't, I'm not saying this in any kind of a racist way. America wouldn't, I, I think we're, we're so divided now as a nation to think of an African-American male standing at the leadership position in this country in the next 20 years, I think is just something that, 
Um, I can't envision. Really? I think where I cannot envision. I cannot. I think we're mm. so divided and we are so happy with the fact that we can hate. Mm. You know, it's it's so disgusting. It's it's part of the, you know, I think the genetic makeup of human beings. I think, you know, our species needs to have something to hate to make themselves feel good enough about living in this existence that we live in. Would you run for Congress or the Senate or governor or something like that? I, I would love to run. I mean, I, I would love to, but I, I just don't think that, that we have the wherewithal as a nation to want to have people who don't look like the majority in a position of authority. Hmm. Um, and we see that every day with, you know, the responses from several people who are in the majority that don't want people who are in the minority to be in office. So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't see that changing anytime soon. I would pray that though out of this generation that we have out here right now, that, and there's this, I think there's this false belief that we don't need leaders who are speakers galvanating groups anymore. I don't believe that. I'm sorry. And yes, yeah. the protests that are taking place right now have been taking place. And if you notice, it doesn't matter. Black Lives Matter. There's not one person that you can point to that's Martin Luther King of Black Lives Matter. There's not one person you can point to that is out there who is the individual leading all of the revolt across the country when they talk about social equity and other things. It's not that one individual. And some people seem to think that, well, she, that she shows that we don't need one. That's not true. Mm. I think that we do need a, a voice. We do need a person or, or a group of people who can step up and say, look, all of your outrage is needed, but let's channel it in mm. this direction. I think that's a really important, I want to I hold on that if I can with you, Montel, because we just, you know, we're recognizing the incredible legacy of John Lewis right now, yes. right? And yes. there are other folks, like people were hoping Kaepernick was going to be out there, you know, in front. He's taken his, his lane. You know, the Black Lives Matter founders, you don't really see them out there much in the national conversation. I mean, I, I feel a void of leadership, right? I mean, the, even the, uh, the Parkland shooting, there were the kids, right? There were these people and the parents that were on Meet the Press, that were out there in the media. You were on the other side, you know, doing booking, doing hosting. You know, why do you think that is? That, that, that there aren't clearly defined leaders. Now, maybe there are and they're not being elevated or maybe it's a different approach where nobody wants to be the leader and everybody wants to be in this kind of, kind of group. But what, what's your breakdown of that? Because I feel there's a void, right? I really I think feel there's like a, there's a need for, for a voice and, and Trump takes advantage of that and it doesn't look like Biden's going to fill it. So, right. so why do you think there isn't a John Lewis or someone like that emerging in the last couple of months? I think, you know, it's a reflection of why Trump is in office. You know, he's a narcissist, mm. a narcissist who have narcissists who like him. And those narcissists are happy as long as that narcissist gives them license. Mm. So they won't step above themselves. They're still too concerned about just themselves to want to take that position on. In some ways, you know, I mean, you could probably, have, somebody might say it about me, well, Mata, if you feel so strong, they want you to stick your, your butt out there and do this. Well, you know, it's because, I don't want to die um, prematurely. And I think that, you know, with, uh, you know, you take a look at the fact that even Dr. Fauci has death threats right now. Come on, man. You know, um, I don't feel like putting myself in a position of my wife or my family in a position that they have to worry about my life. Mm. And, you know, am I now on the other side of the generation that, that needs to be taking the leadership role? I think I am. I think that there's room right now for that individual or that group of individuals to step up together collectively and say, we are ready to chart a path. You know, it's, it's unbelievable, you know, it's, or, or it's it, to want to go somewhere, to want to move forward somewhere is, is a great idea. But unless you have a map that says, let's, do this road, this road, this road, this road, this road, you're never going to get there. Well, as, as, military the driveway. Planners, yeah, as military planners, you know, that's where I go, right? And I think, you know, when you look back on the evolution of a couple of movements of the last decade or two, you know, the Tea Party 
remember when the Tea Party took over Congress, sure. right? And then there was Occupy, and Occupy never really squared that circle to elected office. So the question for the movement becomes, and John Lewis is the manifestation of that, right? And, and, and so many other activists that then became members of Congress and drove a generation of legislation and public policy. Will Black Lives Matter be able to organize enough to take Congress, right? Elected Congress, peaceful Congress, peaceful protest, but an evolution of a political movement that may, you know, it will definitely, it's already changed the Democratic Party, but can it be bigger than that? Can it, can it harness independence? Can it become a, a third party in America? I would love to see independence become a third party. I think that's mm -hmm. one of the most important things that this country needs right now, because we clearly see that, you know, the right and the left, the Democrats and Republicans have gotten so caught up in just being the two party system yeah. and feathering their own part, lining their own pockets that we need something to break this dam. And I think though, right on the periphery, I, I can't give you a name or two, but I remember looking at the news and saying, you know, there's been a couple of people who have stepped up to the plate across the country and running for local offices around the country. And I'm like, where'd that guy come from? Never heard of him before. Mm. Well, it may start breaking through, but that's only if we still have a country after November. Yeah. I mean, let me tell you something. If, if Black Lives Matter and all these groups don't come together and figure out how they can at least demand voter registration and demand that people get out and vote en masse, we may be trying to figure out how we even get to the next election after this one. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Um, that's a splintering, I mean, the, the if, if George Bush hadn't won and beaten Al Gore, I think you would have seen a splintering of the Republican Party. You would have seen yes. the moderates and, and the, uh, the Christian right, you know, break apart, right? And, and now, similarly, if the Democrats, God forbid, blow this, right, and they do lose, I can't imagine AOC and the squad are going to stay in the same party with Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar, right, which Trump would be happy to see that the Democrats splinter even further. But, but I think there is a void of leadership that can square that circle and actually run for office. Maybe it'll happen, but I think, I think it cuts to a core of what we're talking about, Montel, is that a lot of people of the younger generation don't see the traditional parties as their, their, their way forward. Um, you know, right. older folks, for the most part, are, so many of them are, are stuck in the middle. They're unhappy with both parties. So there's this like 40% plus of the country that's kind of a jump ball. And that's part of why I wanted to found this show. And a lot of them, you know, are united in their concern around certain issues. It could be school shootings. It could be national security. It could be the economy. But they don't see a leader that, that captures that. But there is a, a righteous anger. And that's what this show is partially about, is turning it into positive impact. So I want to ask you the question I ask of everyone, Montel. Montel Williams, what makes you angry? What makes me the angriest right now is... You know, the idea and the, the thought that we're about to lose what I and so many others put a uniform on our back for and thought righteously that we were defending a constitution that was a document that was made to actually, I think the constitution was a living document that was made to make sure that it worked perfectly in the times that we're in, but it was a document that I wanted to support because I believe that, you know, when we set about this dream of making this perfect union, if it ever got to fruition, it would be that perfect union on this planet. But what makes me angry right now is that, like you just said, you know, we got probably 30% of this country that at the end of the day, when we take a look at November 2nd, 30% of this country is going to go ahead and vote for Trump, period doesn't matter what he does. I don't care if for the next five months he actually does walk out in the street and shoot somebody like he's in Times Square. He'll be, they will vote for him. You got another 30% of this country that's going to literally do everything it can to not vote for him. But then you got another 40% who are going to sit on their ass and go, I don't know. I don't know. And that 40% is what scares me the most. Mm. And that's 40% is what angers me the most. Mm. Because when they wake up on the third, don't talk trash. Mm. Don't wake up on the third and say, oh, I can't believe. No, yes, believe, because you sat on your ass the day before. Mm. Thank you for that. I think that's, that's powerful, man. Um, 
So maybe an issue, this is going to be a bridge into a transition that may or may not sure. make sense. But one of those issues that I think is, is a, an increasingly moderate, increasingly populist issue that you've been on the forefront uh, on is cannabis reform. And you and I hooked up in part because we were advocating for cannabis access for, for veterans. And, and I've argued for everyone because I think it's a no brainer at this point, but that middle has shifted, right? The populism of that has shifted pretty quickly. Maybe only, you know, gay rights has shifted that quickly in my lifetime. Uh, and now maybe the Black Lives Matter movement, but it shifted very quickly. And in part because of so many, you know, decades of advocacy. Somebody told me once advocacy is not a big bang, it's a drumbeat, right? And that drumbeat right. kept banging and banging, eventually it broke through. But where, where do you think we are right now on cannabis reform and where do you want to see us go? You know, just for so a lot of your listeners understand, I, I didn't jump aboard cannabis and I'm not saying you did, but I didn't jump aboard cannabis in the last three or five years like a lot of people did. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that I got involved in this cannabis movement back in 2020, uh, 2001 when I was told by my own doctor that I needed to get off the opioids that I was on back then and try to do something that would not be as deleterious and harmful to my body as opioids for my pain relief. And I should seek out cannabis. And so since 2001, I've been running around this country trying to ensure that patients have a private conversation with their doctor and nobody else gets in the middle of that. That's been my reason for wanting to force the issue of cannabis. If a doctor can put me on chemotherapy, it's going to burn me from the inside out. And nobody has a, a will open their mouth and say anything about that. Why the heck do you open your mouth and say anything when I'm using cannabis and the same doctor recommended it? And especially it's so pertinent to today, especially when our own government, your taxpayer dollars during the nineties, spent probably around $100 million in research all around the world on cannabis. Back in 2002, back in 1998, we filed for a patent and gave ourselves a patent on cannabis. A lot of people don't know that. The United States government owns the patent on CBD hmm. and has owned it since 2002. Hmm. Are you kidding me? And if you read the abstract, and I'm gonna ask you while we're talking, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this up on my phone. If you read the abstract in the application for the patent, the US government stated unequivocally what they believed marijuana and cannabis was capable of doing back in 2000. So it's not like- Say that again, Montel, we, we, had a, we had a glitch in the, in the feed okay. there. When was it, 2000 when? Back in 2002, when we gave ourselves the patent. Now, back in the early 90s, we backed a, a doctor out of Israel, whose name is Dr. Raphael Meshulam, and funded research conducted by him to identify the component parts of, of cannabis and hemp, to identify whether it was medically efficacious, came back after study after study after study proving the medical efficacy of cannabis. Now we're 20 years later and we're still arguing whether or not it works. And we have dumbasses who are senators and congressmen saying, well, there's not proof that marijuana does. We need to do more research. Shut the, you know what up. You already spent every single year through a program at the University of Mississippi. I don't know if you know this, Paul, but do you know that the U.S. government for the last now 40 plus years cannabis to now there's only three surviving members of the program that started but we've been literally sending out every single month cannabis marijuana cigarettes to now three more patients it started with 20 but only three of them are alive today they're still receiving it and we still send it out through a program at the university of mississippi since when when we, did that start oh man it started under uh, the first bush ah. um and we've been doing this right we've been funding research at the university of mississippi yeah proving the efficaciousness of marijuana. So I, when you ask the question, where is it at? and Where is it going? You know, we're at a place right now where I think it's 37 states and the District of Columbia have now already approved a medical or a adult use cannabis rule. I'm gonna write this down. I'll give you, I'm gonna give you a number so everybody can look it up. Hmm. Um, uh, and, you know, since, sorry, uh, why you while, while you do that, Montel? I mean, I think here's here, from a political standpoint, right? Especially in a time like this, like a time like this, there there's an openness to a lot of things, right? Like a couple of months ago, nobody would have let 
liquor delivery happen at every restaurant in America, right? There's a lot of, lot of, lot of relaxation or openness around regulation and rules in a time of combat, right? Like you and I were yep. in the military. There's uniform standards when you're in garrison and when you're in combat, right? And, and you make things more flexible because it makes you more effective. I don't think there's been a better time for cannabis reform right now. I think Biden's missing the boat. If I were oh, him, I would, the boat. He- I would stand up and say every day, you know what? You don't want to come out and vote because you don't like Trump. I will legalize cannabis. I, he, 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 he probably you, he won't did- go. He probably won't. He probably will want to, you know, parse it and say only medicinal. But if he said, you know, legalization or, or uh, taking it out of class was a class four, right? Removing it from the classification and pushing harder on that. I think it's actually a unifying issue. They're afraid of it, especially the old guard in politics, but the country's there. And that will change it from schedule one to schedule. I think take it out of the scheduling to yeah, begin right. with. Let me give you, entirely. Yeah. Let me give I, you I think, I think that's it's, like, it's, I think it's a, I think it's the equivalent Montel politically of a gun debate. You know, when, when the NRA stands up and says, I'm going to take your guns, right? Yep. Or, or the Democrats are going to take your guns. What, what I think Biden has, an, and Democrats have an opportunity to do is say, is, yo, uh, Trump's going to take your weed. I won't take your weed. <laughs> I won't take your cannabis. Well, I'm Trump will only take your hand. weed if, he, Trump, wait, Trump will only take your weed if Uday and Kuse don't get involved. Right. But you know, he's waiting for Uday and Kuse to get their, get their hands in here so that, you know, he can go ahead and make it another one of the lines that he will make money on. But let me give out the patent number. The patent yeah. number is 6630507. 6630507. <laughs> this is U.S. patent, 6630507 titled Cannabinoids as Antioxidants and Neuroprotectants. This was awarded by the Department of Health and Human Services back in October of 2003. Folks, look up that patent number. You can Google it right now yourself and read under something that's called, you know, read in the, um, the whole patent application. And here, wait a minute. There's, a, there's an area that's called the abstracts. And that area of the abstracts talks about the fact that cannabinoids have been found and discovered to be neuroprotectants. So does and have antioxidant effect? And recently there's been a double blind study peer reviewed document written in JAMA talking about the fact that CBD and THC, but CBD, since people, some people don't want to seem to think that THC is okay, but CBD, THCA, are more powerful antioxidants and and anti-inflammatories than any anti-inflammatory we have in the marketplace. And CBD may prove to be a beneficial anti-inflammatory during COVID. This was recently published. Yep. Well, come on. You may, you know, each show I put an Easter egg uh, sign over my back here in, in the garage at our undisclosed location. And uh, this week, I, I kind of almost ran out of letters on this one, but I just put hydroxychloroquine equals bad because gotcha. many people now know, you know, the FDA came out again and said hydroxychloroquine does not prove to be useful in, in, in combating COVID-19. Trump and Secretary Wilkie and others have been testing hydroxychloroquine on dying veterans, knowing that it doesn't work. They've been lying about it. And at the same time, you know, there could be impacts from cannabis and so many other things that are scientifically supported that they're not talking about. So I think it's, right. it's, it's upside down world, but I think it's a really, it's a good time to have this conversation with you because you've been on the front lines of many of these medical arguments, not just the science, but making the case and from personal experience. And that's when I saw it impacted uh, my, my world the most is when I had friends who lost limbs in Iraq and Afghanistan who said, you know what, this provides me pain relief or people who are, who are struggling with ca- cancer from burn pits and said, this makes me feel better. I said, look, if you've got a 19 year old who you've trusted with a million dollar tank and America's foreign policy in a language he or she doesn't understand, I think you can trust them with cannabis when they get home, right? Like you can Absolutely. trust them with, 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 with a medical uh, a solution that works for them. But I wanna shift because I think, you know, this, this is, uh, I'm glad we're getting into this Montel. You bring positivity. You have done that throughout your career. Your show did that for decades. I feel like I grew up watching your show and many other folks felt the same, but I want to ask you a question I ask of all our guests again, Montel. Montel Williams, what makes you happy? My wife. <laughs> mm. um, who has been a stalwart in my life? Mm. Uh, literally, she's gotten me through some probably of the darkest times. You know, I don't know if you know this or not, but two years ago, well, no, it was three years ago now, um, this month. Yeah, th- no, two, 
yeah, three years ago, this last month, I suffered a major hemorrhagic stroke um, that literally put me in the hospital for almost a full month, almost died. I checked out, we almost checked out a couple of times and were it not for her really hand on me that entire time. She spent every day in the hospital with me. She slept there in the hospital with me in a cot right beside my bed, broke, mm. messed her back up. You know, uh, I wouldn't be here today. Mm. So that's what makes me happy. So I want to just we'll go back one more second with the point that we're making about cannabis. Right now, we know that there are more people who have turned to cannabis during this COVID lockdown than have turned to alcohol. There are people who are turning away from alcohol and getting more and more cannabis delivered. So you're absolutely right. I think if, if Joe Biden would just stop for a second and have a conversation, a real conversation with people, rather than the conversation that he's been having with some of the people that are around him, he would understand that there is no reason why he shouldn't say, I will make sure that cannabis is available and made part of your life if you want it to be. Mm. I think that would get him elected just like that. Montel, you, real conversation has been what you've, you've been all about for your whole career. There are a lot of folks who listen to the show, and especially in this moment, who are grinding it out. You know, for many folks, it feels like Groundhog Day. This, for many folks, is the hardest thing they've ever experienced in their life. We're, we're trying to be unified. We're trying to be positive. You're a man who's you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought up, you know, the, the, the stroke, the near stroke, a couple of, uh, was it, it was an actual stroke or a near stroke? Oh, no, dude. I had a, a fully blown cat, uh, category four, category three. I remember, I remember because I, I was DMing you being like, Hey man, I haven't heard from you in a while. Where are right. you? And then your right. colleague came on and said, Oh, you don't know. He's hot. He's in the hospital. He's sick. So I, I, you know, followed that journey of yours, which is another, you know, triumph over adversity. That's been a lot of what your life is about and you've inspired so many people. So What's your message to people right now? Maybe they're listening to the show. Maybe they had a shitty day, shitty month, shitty year, or they're just grinding it out. You know, you've been through the ups and downs. Can, can you share with them any insight or inspiration from your life that might serve them well? You know, I, I realized myself in the last, you know, really the last 30 days that I, no matter what, man, I try my best to always be a person who sees the world half full, the glass half full. I'll never see it half empty, ever. It's mm -hmm. always half full. Even when I want to try to get myself into a depression, it's half full. I can't do it any other way. And I do that. And I believe that because I've also believed something since I was a small child. I alone own the definition of who I am. Mm. No one else can define me but me. I have the capability, you know, if I believed all the bull crap that people have said about me being a kid born in the ghetto, I should be dead or in jail. If I believe all the crap that people said about me of, of African American male who supposedly does the worst with MS than anybody else, then I should be dead. If I believed all the crap that everybody else had to say about me, I wouldn't be me. I believe that I'm capable of doing whatever I set my mind to. As long as I can get the education and get the, get the information I need to be able to support it, I can get it done. I mean, Paul, like right now, I'm working on, you know, I'm working on one initiative. I've been working on this initiative for 10 years now, the PONS device, a portable neuromodulation device to help relieve people of symptoms of traumatic brain injury and MS and other neurological disease. I'm working on another initiative with a doctor that I found out who has the number one protocol right now in the world for PTSD and not just combat PTSD, but he works on childhood PTSD, everything from, you know, child trauma to rape and to car accidents and to, to he, as a matter of fact, the, the protocol he's been using has been used by New York State and by Albuquerque, New Mexico for uh, helping first responders. And it is, has a 90% efficacy rate. I'm working on that right now. I literally in the last three weeks have been involved in a process right now because I have a very close friend of mine who is getting ready to manufacture, getting ready to build, build a factory in Salt Lake City area that produces KMN95 masks and will produce it here in the United States made from all 100% U.S. component made parts. And in our discussions, I've been trying to convince them that when they employ people, they employ veterans. Okay, I'm working on. Um, uh, You're uh, working on a cannabis. lot of stuff, man. You're always I'm working. working on a lot of stuff. I think, I'm working I think, on I think cannabis. That's, that's part of it. Yeah. That's part of why I love being around you because you're a hardworking man, and and you you keep it real. You, you know, you look out for others. You've been a really powerful voice too for so many communities that needed a voice, and you have been ahead of the curve on on many things. On MS, you've been out there. On cannabis, you've been out there. On veterans issues, you were out there, you know, long before it was popular. 
and, and, and easy to do. And I'm grateful for you for that. Oh, thank and you, just sir. the positivity. And, and it, you know, it's hard to put yourself out there. And you've been putting your own personal story out there in a very powerful way. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. And uh, I have gifts for you as a part of oh, my expression you, of that gratitude. Since you said made by veterans, I got some Angry Americans uh, merch coming your way, like the one I'm wearing here. But Yay. we got some super comfortable Angry Americans merch. I've actually got a Go Navy shirt that I can get you to. It breaks my heart. <laughs> breaks my yeah. heart. But I'll, but I'll send it to you anyway. Um, Great. Got some stuff coming from you from, from Bravo Sierra, which is a, another supporter of this show. It's hard to see on the screen. There we go. Bravo Sierra. Um, got it. They, they make deodorant and, and antibacterial wipes. Uh, they support veterans, give back. So I want to send you some of that. And then um, per our earlier discussion, I'm going to send you some Uncle Neil's, <laughs> 1884. Hey. It's not scotch, uh, but it's small batch whiskey in America. Uh, the legacy of Nearest Green, who was the former slave who taught Jack Daniels how yes. to make whiskey. Yes. Great story and great stuff that if you can't drink it, you can share it, give it to your wife. or You know what I'll do? I, I will, I'll guarantee you I'll take one big shot of that for sure, my friend. <laughs> and then lastly – maybe for after you, you experience a little cannabis. Um, we have a, an ongoing discussion and, and debate about <laughs> peeps. This started early. I ask every guest, if you had to pick one color of peeps, this is our Rorschach test of the show. Montel Williams, yellow, pink, or blue? Which color of peeps would you choose and why? Dude, I grew up on, you know, I don't know, maybe the, 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 the yellow or the cheaper version, I don't know. But when I was a child, my mom used to make sure there were peeps always in our Easter basket and they were always yellow. So yeah, I definitely would pick the yellow one. It's a you know, classic, right? Mind. Yeah. The classic peep, my friend, Sarah, Jessica Parker. Thank you the, so much. Called them the OG of peeps. And they, they are. <laughs> that's a fact. Yep. They are. It's probably got some weird, you know, yellow dye 30 in it or something, but who knows? Who cares? If anybody can find out, I think it'll be you. <laughs> there you go. There you but go. I, I am, I'm grateful for your leadership, your friendship, your inspiration, your patriotism, um, you know, you, you're really, really an incredible leader, and I'm grateful for all the support you've given me and so many causes I care about. Uh, thank you for joining me on this show, my friend. It's been a well, real thank pleasure. Thank you so much honor. for having me. Thank, thank you so much for having me, man. And I hope that your listeners, you know, again, look up that that patent just in case anybody who questions whether or not you and I are on the right path when it comes to cannabis recommendations. But look up the patent, and you yourself will understand why it's so important. That's part of our our really our basic genetic makeup. Well, and, and if, uh, if America, you know, basically invented the internet, you know, we could own cannabis and, and we could be on the front lines of COVID. This is, you know, uh, uh, General Petraeus has been a supporter of mine for a long time and, and, and uh, taught me a lot. And he always says, you know, every crisis has opportunity. And this is a crisis absolutely. that has an opportunity for America, but it's going to be leadership and leadership like you and so many. I'm glad we got into that today, but it's leadership that's always defined America. And it's what we need now. And anybody listening can look to you for an example of what leadership looks like, my friend. Thank you, sir. And when you reach out to General Petraeus next time, tell him I said hi. He actually got me, a, really sponsored a trip for me to go to Afghanistan and visit the troops. I had dinner with him at his war desk in Afghanistan and then utilized his plane to jump around to several different bases just to go out and help motivate the troops over there. And I'll, that's a time in my life that I will never forget. Shit. Well, that, that's a great story, man. And thank you for sharing that. Thank you for all you do. The great and powerful Montel Williams. Stay frosty, my friend. You too, my friend. Stay well. Go Army. Beat Navy. <laughs> Not going to happen this year. <laughs>